Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Bart, how are you doing? About a nine out of ten today. Nine out of ten. That's those yeah. are high numbers. It, no, that's good. That's yeah, good. that's it's a great really day. Was that for the ribbon dance or the floor exercise? <laughs> just all of it together. Oh, yeah, you're over, just overall such a, score. You're such an all-around athlete. So yeah, we've um, got uh, Dr. Larry Bramlage back on the show today. Back in with us today. You know, our first discussion with him was was fabulous. We talked about his career. Um, b- before and, and and still, we're going to talk about his career today and and more what he's seen. Uh, you know, from advances and how it's how it's changed, and so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, he's been at this a while, and um, he's actually been pretty influential on the direction of equine surgery. So I'm looking forward to him telling us how things were, how they've developed during his career, and where he sees things going. Not only in like the the science and art of veterinary medicine, but also where he sees the industry because he's plugged right into the racing industry and has been very influential there as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's done a lot of good. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bring him in. Why, he, why hesitate? Why hesitate? Coming up next, we uh, get Dr. Larry Bramlage back on the show. See you soon. <laughs> welcome to Stallside. It's good to be here again. Yeah, it's good to have you back. Yeah, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Yeah, so... Um, We'd like to talk today about some of the advances you've seen in veterinary medicine during your career and what you think the most impactful things are going forward. Um, well, obviously, when you hang around for as long as I have, you see some great things. I, um, Wayne McElraith is a good friend of mine, and we've talked often that we happened along in the golden age of veterinary medicine because the discoveries that happened during our careers enabled us to do what we have done, but it, it changed veterinary medicine to a real um, profession. A lot of the things that happened, um, it, it took veterinarians from being the person in town who did all species and everything, but never did anything very deep or maybe very well, depending on who it was. Um, and just the things in the different disciplines has not only split veterinarians into species, but into subspecialties. And a lot of it had to do with the advances. I mean, reproduction, nothing holds a candle to the ultrasound right. machine. Yeah. I mean, that opened so many doors. Um, it made the breeding of horses um, a science rather than an art. Um, as far as teasing the mares and breeding the stallions that allowed the stallions to breed more mares because you guys got so good at timing whenever the stallion was breeding so that, you know, they don't, they don't cover more than 1.2 or three times to get a mare in full, um, over the season. And the elimination of twins. That was, that was huge. Twins. And, uh, and it made everybody better palpators too. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, unlike me, whenever I was in school, all I could feel was fecal balls. (laughs) 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 Um, So uh, being able to to actually look inside the ovaries and see what's going on, that's the big, huge advance there. And then, um, you know, the GI, uh, I think nothing, um, nothing holds a candle to the parasiticides, the ivermectins. That um, when when I first started as a surgeon, um, the the a twenty year old horse was an old horse because almost all horses eventually died from um, thromboembolic episodes with strongylus vulgaris. Um, very few of them would develop enough immunity that they would go beyond the early 20s. But um, now, a 30-year-old horse, it's not unusual for you guys in medicine. Mm-hmm. And, and and now you have a whole new bureau of diseases that you have to deal with because horses never got that old in the past. Uh, and now they get all these these conditions. So uh, in the in the GI tract, the handling the parasites is, is um, probably the biggest scenario there. Um, the, the surgery aspect, there's, there's, there's several big discoveries, but you have to give credit to the anesthesiologists because if they hadn't 
developed anesthesia as a science, we wouldn't be able to do what we do in the surgery room because, uh, and, you know, John Hubble was a big part of that. He and Bill Muir did a, a lot of the research that showed us that the important thing to monitor in horses was arterial blood pressure. Um, you know, all the things that they monitor, a lot of things in people, but, you know, entitled CO2 and all the things that they're looking at in people, most of those aren't very important in horses. But if you don't keep their arterial blood pressure up, then they tie up whenever they are getting up. And, you know, the it doesn't take them long to take a long surgery and make it in a disaster. Uh, and so the advancements that have been made in general anesthesia allow us to do a three-hour surgery, four-hour surgery, uh, and still get the horse back on their feet. Uh, so without them, we wouldn't have been able to do what we do. Um, bone plating as, as internal fixation has been a, a, a big advance in, in saving a, a group of horses that require that, but it's still not the day-to-day -day advancement that the arthroscope has made um, and endoscopes, as far as GI systems, they're, they're equal as important, um, gastric ulcers and, you know, the respiratory tract. Um, the, the endoscope has made it possible to do lots of things that, you know, when I was, I remember my first week as an intern, um, when they got the first flexible endoscope at Ohio State, before that, it was the rigid scope, so you had to look in and if the horse jerked his head you'd hit his ethmoid and, and the session was over because he was, <laughs> bleeding, he was bleeding all over everybody um so the endoscopes have made a big difference but in the arthroscope um, it's changed orthopedic surgery on joints from the last resort which is what it was whenever um i first started doing surgery when i first became boarded and uh, we were doing arthrotomies. The, the the interns now can't believe you guys used to cut in the joints like that. And I said, yeah, I mean, there was no alternative that, um, because they just like the cell phone, they don't know life without an arthroscope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they'd all be lost without a cell phone. I wonder what would happen if you just took all the cell phones oh, away from the interns. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of people that couldn't get home. Yeah. Right? <laughs> There'd be a lot of crying in the corners, I think. Yeah. Um, so, um, that, you know, those things have, um, in, in each of the specialties have moved us, um, light years forward. We piggyback on to human medicine, certainly quite a bit. Um, and we were kind of moving out of the era of, uh, physical advancements, you know, the, the, having the bone plates and having the arthroscopes and, uh, having the endoscopes to biologic uh, treatments. Now they're becoming more and more important. Stem cells are as close to magic as, um, as I've ever seen in orthopedic surgery. They, they help us do some things we had no chance at treating before. Um, they're not, they, they can't handle everything for sure, but they sure push back the threshold of uh, non-treatable diseases. Uh, we're about to publish a paper in, or hopefully publish, we're about to send it off on suspensory branch injuries that we treated with, uh, with the stem cells. And it looks like around 70% of those horses will be racing. Mm -hmm. uh, for as before, it used to be about the opposite. Yeah. You, you would lose about 70% of them. Um, and so um, stem cells can do lots of things. So we still don't really know um, how stem cells work. I mean, it's initially people thought that the stem cells went in and did the repair, but uh, they're they're just supervisors. They don't actually do the repair at all. Um, their job is to sense the environment, and they cause the cells doing the repair to do a better job. Um, and so uh, it, that was sort of uh, fortuitous because um, in you know in veterinary medicine we often skip a lot of steps, and it turns out that if you just put a stem cell into an environment that needs help it does a pretty good job of reading the environment um, and causing the cells to do um, what the stem cell perceives it needs to do. Now, not always is the, that the right thing. Like 
it's not moved us as far forward in tendons as it has in ligaments because it seems like the stem cells read the environment in tendons and cause the tendon to produce fibrous tissue, which is not what we want. We want more elastic tissue, but you put them into a ligament and they do a lot better job. I do not know why. Um, and, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of the people doing research on stem cells and um, it's an intriguing question, but now, um, We've moved another step forward, and what people are really working on now is what are called exosomes. Um, that's how the stem cell communicates to the cells in the environment. So if you could figure out the right exosome for repairing a suspensory ligament and produce that, and people are pretty close to doing that now, um, then you could have that on the shelf and reconstitute it and put it directly into the injury. You totally skip the step of culturing the stem cells out of the bone marrow, which we have to do now, and put it into, the, into that environment. What, the, what needs to be perfected is to know which exosome is right for which area, and that'll probably take, I don't know, 10 years maybe, for people to figure that out. But once you figure that out... Um, and can do that, it will move stem cells even farther forward. Can you imagine figuring out what exosome you had to put into an abdomen to cause a pancreas to produce insulin? Um, you know, if, if somebody can figure out that, you could cure diabetes or treat diabetes way more effectively than we do now. It's a mm. leading killer in people. Yeah. So um, I think that's a real... Um, exciting area. I mean, I'll probably be pushing up daisies before we can get to that point, but uh, um, it, it's it's really intriguing as far as uh, what I think the biologic horizon has in, in in that area. And then, you know, the it used to be the only thing we had to treat intraarticularly in joints were corticosteroids, and then hyaluronic acid came along, and now there's all the biologic compounds like IRAP and um, the, there are comparable cytokine containing intraarticular injections, which don't have the harmful side effects that corticosteroids do. So, uh, we still use corticosteroids in, in, in instances where their forte is, but we've sort of moved away from corticosteroids into biologic treatments now and they work a lot better. Um, so, um, that's a frontier that's going to keep moving forward. Um, you know, there'll be advances in imaging that we can't even perceive now. You know, you might, you might one day really have the Star Trek tricoder where, mm -hmm. <laughs> where you go over and it, and, and it fixes the problem. Um, but, you know, the, the imaging coming along from the, when I was a veterinary student, we still hand dip films. I, I don't know if you did that in New, in New Zealand. That yeah, I, I started off with the, with the, with the dip tank. Yep. Yeah, and, uh, and then, you know, there's a big deal to get the automatic developer. And then, uh, and then, you know, now if you show a celluloid film to an intern, they say, what's that? Yeah, you know, you what's know, the hot light for? <laughs> yeah, still yeah. sitting in the corner. What do you yeah. use that for? Yeah, exactly. So digital imaging. No, no, no. I, I, was, at, I was in the repository the other yeah. day, and, and one of the interns asked me what the box was. They go, well, we don't have films, but that's, yeah, they literally asked. They had no idea. No yeah. idea that how x-rays used to be yeah. taken. Didn't under. realize they'd gone to the museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the... Digital imaging has just quantumly gone forward. CTs now, um, the 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 real ideal equine CT is yet to be invented because they all of them they're, they're available, but they all have quirks that um, are not real easy to overcome. Um, you know, and the same with MRI. Um, and so MRI is equally as applicable in uh, the horse as it is in uh, people in a lot of diseases. Uh, for instance, the foals with infected joints. I mean, um, foals you can handle. You can put them in the CT a lot. I'm sorry, the MRI a lot easier and, uh, or even the CT, and they'll tell you how deep the hole is, mm -hmm. you know, that you're treating. And, and the key for a lot of those, you can tell this better than I can, but the key to a lot of those foals is to know whether you have a chance or not, you know, because you can really run up a lot of bill and it, and it might be a horse that you never had a chance to begin with. So imaging is going to be huge. <clears throat> and then 
you know, the in racing, uh, I think there's a tremendously exciting item on the horizon. Um, the um, Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation, which both of us have um, um, reviewed grants for them, I funded a project recently to look at um, what happens when a horse starts going off form. In other words, they're not performing as well as they had been. Is there a clue that something is happening? And eventually, if you don't pay attention to that, that results in an injury, which could be a catastrophic injury. And um, the, the research was first done on uh, the horses in Tasmania because they had a population that was locked in on the island. They all raced over the same racetrack. They all had their records. Um, and the discovery was that when a horse starts to go off form, the, the question was, do they cycle less often? I mean, do, are they don't make as many strides or are there, is their stride length shortening? It, the answer is that the stride length shortens. Um, and that's a clue that starts showing up as early as three races before a race when a horse gets has gotten injured in their data. So that clue comes along. Most trainers know when a horse is not quite right. Uh, and and uh, a lot of, they do a lot of uh, things to try to get the horse back. I mean, it could be that the horse's GI tract is not doing the right thing, that their respiratory tract's not doing the right thing. But the overwhelming number is that they have a musculoskeletal problem. Um, and so just knowing from that data that the stride length was Im important is uh, gives us a clue as to where to look. Um, but the, the thing on the horizon that I think is really going to be exciting is, you know, daily racing form has been around for ages. Um, most of that entry of all that data is done by hand. Um, you know, the, the, the time splits and, and the when a horse works in the morning, how fast they work. They have the clockers on the backside of the racetrack. Um, and that is going to move digital. Um, it, it only makes sense that it would because everything else is going digital as well. But the, the ability to put a, a little pack of cigarette size thing in the, on the back of a saddle pad on every horse that breezes and the data will automatically go into the Equibase, which now owns the daily racing form data, that will automatically go into Equibase um, and be recorded. So you can go look at it. You can produce the racing programs. Um, so that's all going to become automated. Well, here's the, here's the exciting part about that. Um, if that becomes automated, it's not a huge step to designing an algorithm that makes a horse his own control. That is, when the horse is um, racing at his top form, he'll have a certain cycle rate and a certain stride length. Um, and you could construct the algorithm that says, this horse's stride length is shortening. Somebody needs to look closer at this horse. And a lot of times that happens before they even have overt lamenesses mostly because a lot of racehorse lamenesses are bilateral. You know, they have both front limbs, so they're really not nodding on any front limb. Um, both of them are hurting. Um, and so I, I think that in the future, what will be a gigantic step forward in the management of racehorses and racing injuries is that you automatically can know what this horse's best form is and the uh, artificial intelligence can tell you when that form changes. Uh, and it might be end up to say <clears throat> to the examining veterinarians on the morning of a race, take a close look at this horse. It, 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 it more uh, better off would be if the information were available to say to the trainers, something's wrong with this horse. You need to take a closer look at him because uh, um so many of the times um, in the past, not so much now because uh, the pre-race exams have gotten so much more sophisticated um, and um, there used to really not even be 
pre-race exams as we know them now. Um, but if that could all be automated to say, uh, this horse is, I'm just pulling these numbers out of the air, but to just say, this horse's stride length is shortened 25%. He should not race until the answer as to why that happening has been discovered. So if, if the algorithm red flags this horse, then the trainer uh, knows to go to the veterinarian to get a lameness exam or get radiographs or something. Right now, we're, we're dependent upon uh, pain, heat, or swelling as a clue as to where the problem is or as um, – we do on two days a week here, look at lameness exams and, and see if we can figure out what's causing the horse to, to uh, not perform as well. But I think, you know, just all of the, 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 the two biggest um, things that turn off people who are not uh, ingrained in racing, you know, the casual fan are drugs and injuries. Yeah. And, and a lot of times they view those as intermingled and sometimes mm -hmm. truthfully they are, uh, but not always. Um, and a lot of injuries happen and the horses never even had a veterinarian look at them um, because nobody really knew that this was coming. If we, if we could do that automatically um, it would be a quantum leap forward because it, it makes the red flag pop up a lot sooner than it does now. And, I, you know, some trainers are very good at that. They're very good at knowing. And some trainers aren't as good, aren't as experienced or, or whatnot. And, and, you know, the how trainers look at a horse coming back from uh, work in the morning and know that, other than the time that the horse went, but know that the horse is thriving on that work or having trouble with the work, I got no idea. But some of them are quite good at mm -hmm. it, yeah. very intuitive as to mm. what to do. So I think those things are big. We're, we're you know, the, the artificial intelligence, I, I, I don't even, um, in people, artificial intelligence reads all the mammograms now. Uh, so uh, that, that to some degree might happen in veterinary medicine as well. The, to this point, um, uh, the imaging is it requires some interpretation as so so well known with sales radiographs that you find lots of things that are variations of normal or maybe they're actually are pathology but they're inconsequential um and um it's taken us quite a long time to ferret out the things we should really be worried about and the things that we can deal with um so uh, I don't know that it'll be um, the, the the artificial intelligence is going to tell you a lot of things that you still have to have a human to look at and say this is abnormal, but it's not in it's not consequential to the horse. Uh, so mm -hmm. it it won't totally take or it won't replace us. I guess maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think we have a lot of room to move forward in in. Uh, racing management and you know the there's there's a there's this big question mark that remains is some people feel racing is a dying sport um but if you look at what's happened in japan and hong kong now admittedly um they have a much more reserved place they don't have the competition in gaming that that we have here but racing in hong kong 10 years ago began to dip. Um, and, you know, we, we blame it on in the United States that we're less agricultural than we used to be, which is a factor because people, if people grow up around horses, they're, they're more interested in horses, but look at Hong Kong. None of those people right. grew mm -hmm. up on a farm. They grew up in those high rises, but the gathering together of um, people on a, I believe it's Wednesday night that they have, um, they they have made an event out of the racing program with entertainment, with dinner, with um, so that the twenty and thirty something accountants and um, 
MBAs, uh, that's where they go on Wednesday nights. And, you know, rather than just go out and go to dinner, um, when you get together with friends, it's it's a lot of fun to get together um, with a group of people around an event. I mean, that's why people go to football games, mm -hmm. um, because um, you can be real football fans, which I love college football. Um, but I would get together with my family less often to just sit around and have dinner or watch TV than we do to get together and go to a football sure. game. And, and, and so the, the Hong Kong has proven that that system works. But one of the things that you have to have with that system is absolute integrity and, um, and no unavoidable uh, or no avoidable injuries that you can have. So, I mean, I think all of this fits together. Um, it's still, racing is still a thinking man's gambling game because when we go to the racetrack, I'm playing against you two, not against the house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right. literally the racetrack takes the cut, but um, there are so many ways to evaluate um, a horse's past performance and, um, it, it's, you know, it's like the two people in the bear in the woods. <laughs> you don't have to be yeah. faster than the bear, just, <laughs> just faster the than the other guy. <laughs> and so, uh, um, I think that it, assuming that we can handle the big issues, um, that we just mentioned, uh, there's still room for people who want that mental challenge of handicapping a race. I have to admit, I'm, I'm not very good at it. And when I do do it, it takes me a long time. But some people can handicap really pretty quickly. And I think a lot of that's all practice. Um, so, But if you do a good job studying, you know how it always makes sense after the race? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, you can say, oh, yeah. I should have known. How did I miss that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... Uh, I I think um, we're doing a lot of good things, and and uh, I don't think um, racing is doomed if we continue to do our part. Yeah, no, because what you said about the be being a vent. I don't know, Peter. Oh, yeah. You ever been? You ever been to the racetrack, Saratoga? Not when it's been running. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. What a it's it's a social event. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a it's a it's a fa if a family social event. It's it's unreal. It's Nothing like ever. racing at Keeneland is is fabulous. Saratoga, so even but I grew up in uh, Sandy Downs and Lebois Park, and just there's something about those being there with those horses and watching them mm -hmm. come around that turn. It's there's nothing like it, and so yeah. I, I think that stirs something in in the human heart that won't go away anytime soon. Well, everybody needs something to yell at. <laughs> right so it's yeah. either the horses or each other yeah well yeah. it's like the football game you can yeah, you yeah. can you can yell a lot louder there than you can in your living room yeah, yeah, shake exactly. a few cowbells depending on what team you're for <laughs> yeah i mean it gives you something to talk about with each yep. other all during the afternoon and, and and you i mean you're totally right about saratoga all the boutique meets are in good shape the you know the the grinded out meets i think are probably um, doomed, destined to fail. If you look at all the old racetracks, they're all in, in uh, uh, industrial neighborhoods mm. because the, 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 the person going to work on the three o'clock shift stopped and bet the daily double. That's why the daily double is the first two races. The guy's going to work at three o'clock, bet the daily double. The guy's getting off at three o'clock, bet the feature. And so um, the, all, all of those blue collar workers, they grew up in in that environment and and that those factories don't exist anymore um for the most part or they're a different kind so that's why the boutique racetracks in places that are nice venues that have the atmosphere like saratoga like hong kong is generated like del mar generates uh, i think um those will probably be our model. The, the thing I'm worried about is that we not go the way that standard bread racing did sort of and with a, with a grand circuit so that uh, racing totally moves from one racetrack to the other to the other and it's all simulcast. So then you lose all the minor league teams like baseball yeah. has. Uh, and baseball is 
realize the importance of the minor league teams. I think we have to realize the importance of the smaller racetracks. And, uh, you know, in, in England, the Jockey Club has started taking over some of the small racing venues um, there. I, I, I believe it's a Jockey. One of the organizations in England has taken over a couple of them to help them survive. And the, the Jockey Club here is sort of looking at that concept Mm -hmm. of is that where we should be in the same vein as major league baseball supports minor league teams um so should should we be supporting those places which are grassroots fan developing areas yeah. and, and 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 if that's the case we, we can probably do those places a lot better than they could be a mini saratoga so i think that's uh, uh, maybe a real viable option in the future well, that's exciting. The artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's fabulous, and that's not something you would have, you know, thought might come out of this um, podcast. But it's it's certainly uh, so, something that could absolutely change the way we we do things. I hope it's better than natural intelligence and in situations. <laughs> so, getting on that vein, it's really fascinating about the change in stride length. And you mentioned imaging. So, if this horse is objectively measured to have a decreasing stride length. Are we going to be able to see any changes on the current uh, imaging we have with uh, CTMR? Is there something else coming down the pike that you think may actually help us with those horses? Veterinarians? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah, no. Because the, um, you know, there are lameness locators um, all around these computerized gyroscopes, uh, inertial sensors that you put all over the horse. And you see, if you give a horse one, lame leg, those things are very good at finding that. But if you give them two or three lame legs, the computer gets confused. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's hard. So I think um, the there is always going to be a place where veterinarians have to examine the horse. And in order to take the right radiographs, you got to know where to point the machine. Um, you know, people, people do bone scans. Uh, one, bone scans are very we, – we do a lot of them. Um, they're pretty highly misunderstood. People think they're a lameness meter. Uh, you just, you know, put that nuclear dye in there and um, it'll tell you where it is. All it tells you is skeletal activity. A lot of the things you find are innocuous. Um, so you need someone to interpret it and you, and you also need to know – you will always have to look and see if that's the place the horse is lame. So I don't think we'll ever be able to totally image our way into a horse's soundness. Uh, and, and in fact, when that's done now, you make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Um, if you just do a bone scan and x-ray, everything that lights up on the, on the bone scan First of all, you're going to be spending a lot of money on things that don't really matter. Second of all, you may not even have imaged the right place because the horse might have a proximal suspensory injury, which doesn't show doesn't up on show. the bone scan. Mm -hmm. uh, so you got to do the lameness exam to see whether um, the, the bone scan is pointing you in the right direction. It's just information, just like um, digital imaging is just information. The CT is just information. Um, if that information is refined enough um, over time and simple enough, the human mammogram, um, artificial intelligence can read those. But I don't know, um, you know, certainly I don't think I will ever see it where um, we get imaging so sophisticated that you don't require a human to be part of the equation. No, that's that's a really good point. You say it's, it's raw information, someone's got to interpret it. Um, what I was getting at is... Uh, People are talking about pet scanning now. So how is pet scanning going to help us out with those horses that have those in sort of developing lesions that we can't get any other way? Um, pet scan is a, for conceptually a three-dimensional bone scan. Um, it, it measures activity in a little different way than a bone scan does. Uh, but you can't pet scan a whole horse. You have mm -hmm. to know where the, the problem it. is. And um, – in, in the horse, 60% uh, of all fatal injuries happen in the fetlock joint. So that would be the first place you would, you would point the PET scan. Um, PET scan moves us up significantly in um, injuries within the sesamoid bone, particularly, uh, because 
about half of the um, breakdown injuries, the ruptured suspensory apparatus, go through the sesamoids. Um, maybe depending on what location you are in the country, uh, it varies a little with the surfaces you're racing on. But um, there are horses that you can isolate the, the lameness to the area of the fetlock, but radiographs are pretty dull tool in looking at sesamoids. Radiographs are pretty good on cannon bones and P1s for injuries there, but they're not very good on sesamoids. We, we can't see inside the bone where the action is happening, and PET scan can. So in that cadre of horses where we are pretty sure the injury is in the fetlock joint and the x-rays are negative, PET scan is where it's going to go. Um, and again, you, you have to know where to point the PET scan, mm -hmm. um, but it gives you a um, level of information that, you, that we can't find right now. So, mm -hmm. Bone scans are hot in the general area but they're not three-dimensional mm -hmm. like a PET scan is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's another step forward for sure. So yeah. there's, and they're starting to show up on the racetracks a little bit, um, you yeah. know, to diagnose those horses a little bit. And that might be help us move forward a little bit too on preventing breakdowns. For sure. I think it will. I mean, it'll become standard. Um, you know, we're one of the people who are, we're some of the people who are standing in line to get the machines. I mean, the um, machines are new, a couple of years old, and uh, Matthew Spray has done a really good job with it, working with the company that's building that. And and um, the good thing about a, the PET scan is it's portable, it's durable, and it's quick. And so you can get it at those horses that we were talking about whose stride lengths are shortening um, relatively quickly compared to, for instance, an MRI, which is, which is hard, harder logistically to, to, to get an image. Um, this PET scan machine is not all that it's, it's a, you know, it's like an ultrasound machine, a little bigger uh, than that. So um, it's turned out to be a really good um development, I think. And, and, and that's one more thing that'll help us with what we need to know. Um, you mentioned about putting biologics in the joint. Um, what advances have there been on actually cartilage itself? We may cut down the inflammatory mediators, but where are we with like trying to regenerate cartilage and that you can't really replace what was there, but how close are we getting to putting something in there which functionally is appropriate? Here's the problem that nobody solved it. And if you can solve it, we'll go to in the business. Uh, <laughs> people have figured out how to grow cartilage. You can grow high quality um, fibrocartilage that are, actually has proteoglycan in it. You can even come pretty close to growing hyaline cartilage, which is what we're born with. Mm -hmm. The thing that you can't solve, that we can't solve yet, the thing that limits everything we do is anchoring that cartilage to the surface of the bone. Um, we have techniques that help microfracturing, makes little cracks in the surface and helps the fibrocartilage grow in. But in an athlete as big and as fast as a racehorse going 40 miles an hour, when you load fibrocartilage, it just skins it off the surface of the bone because it can't hang on like hyaline. Hyaline cartilage has a really highly developed collagen anchorage into the surface of the subchondral bone where the cartilage lives. Um, so until we can figure out how to replace that, it doesn't do us any good to grow really high quality cartilage in a Petri dish or move cartilage from one joint to the other. All of it, those are things that people do. But as of now, we can't anchor them onto the surface of a joint that has been injured and have it survive. Um, it'll, fibrocartilage is a pretty high quality substitute for uh, a broodmare in a pasture uh, because so many horses with injuries to their joints, so many people like me who have injuries to their joints, um, we get to a steady state that we are comfortable walking around, but we could never load that cartilage to the, to the degree that it requires for um, island cartilage or any substitute cartilage to survive. So now arthroscopic surgery is totally dependent upon 
preventing the degeneration of the joint further. You take out the problem that's adding the fuel to the fire, and the horse survives or the person survives on the remaining articular surface. That's why arthroscopy was so good because it moved the treatment of joint injuries forward, and it's now a prevention. Um, I mean, trainers have it used to be you had to talk people into trainers into doing arthroscopies. Now sometimes you got to talk them out of it. Yeah, uh, and, and so um, it's all a matter of solving the problem before it becomes a global problem for the joint. Um, and it, it, th that problem of once the cartilage wears through, how do you get something to replace it? Until somebody figures out how to anchor cartilage to bone, we'll never solve that nut. Um, like I said, if you can figure that out, mm -hmm. we yep. can go into business. Yeah, we can hang our earphones up right now. <laughs> I have an idea, but it's yours. <laughs> well, count me in. Yeah. Well, it just goes to show, you know, there's nothing better than what Mother Nature gave you, right? That's, that's certainly true with hyaline cartilage. I mean, it's it's as sophisticated for making joints move as the horse is for running. Um, it's that high mm. quality. Yeah, she's had many more years to work on that than we have. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for being with us today. Um, it's it's been a great conversation. Anything else that you see on the horizon that's gonna that's gonna move us forward? I don't know. I mean the. Uh, um, the Grayson Foundation, which, as I, we mentioned before, um, I think is moving the ball along step by step. Um, it's the largest funder of equine research now pretty much in the world. Um, it used to be the British Horse Racing Association funded more, but now mm. that's gone by the wayside. So the Grayson Foundation now is the premier funder, and um, it has a well-deserved reputation for producing quality results uh, from the research. But research is expensive, becoming more expensive, and it's slower than most people would like. You make There's only so many times you're going to discover penicillin. Uh, yeah, right. And so um, you, you have to make incremental stops. And, um, I, you know, there's things that... Um, as far as infectious diseases, I mean, that's been a place where I think the Grayson Foundation has really helped us in knowing how to mean how how to uh, handle an outbreak of herpes. Uh, a lot of all that work was funded by the Grayson Foundation. Um, um, it's a, the Jockey Club's research arm, um, and um, I think that is an avenue that uh, we need to keep supporting. Uh, so that keeps moving forward. But as far as what's going to be the next discovery of penicillin, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think we'll keep making small mm -hmm. chunks. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the thing. You're right. There's sort of going to be evolution, not revolution, right? Yeah, for sure. And Folks, goes. when I look at my career, you, t you talked about yours, even mine, which is somewhat shorter. But it's the, the changes. Unbelievable how we practice now compared to how I did when I started. Well, so, sorry. I would say, so we, we can't even imagine what the next great step might be. Right. I mean, it's, it, we can't fathom it yet, you know. So, so. Well, look how techs change the practice, right? Okay, we're all sort of like bumping around with ultrasound, just the way radiology is done. Like as that went from the process, it went to CR and then it's gone to DR, right? Yeah. And that's, that's so much better. Look how we manage the practice, the software now. Mm -hmm. Not sitting at desktop, it's in the cloud. Our record system is actually in the cloud and it's real time. And so, yeah, I mean, tech has really impacted it. You wouldn't think that technology would have that much to do with something that's based on biology, but it's absolutely revolutionizing everything at every level from management yeah. to um, drug discovery to um, is a joint repair. I mean, the the drugs that we have access to doing um, medicine type things is just is just stuff you would have thought of. The concept of RNA vaccines. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. You, you know, I mean, that is a totally different approach to immunization rather than trying to depend on the DNA within yeah. the within the um, virus. And you know, that's has received a lot of. Um, publicity with the COVID vaccine, but rightfully so. It's a it's a different approach that was 
coming along just yep. in time for that to happen, yeah. but it's happening in veterinary medicine yeah. too. You know? and, and, and if it can solve rotococcus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just look at what the, I mean, that, that that's a disease that doesn't go away. No. I mean, no matter what we do, um, it, it's, it's beat us at every turn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's tenacious, and there's a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of minds have been invested in trying to beat that condition. And it's just like Mr. Weeble Wobble. You think you punched it, and it just comes back at you and sort of says, strike me again because yeah. I'm just as strong as I was before. Every five years, there's a new solution, but it turns out it doesn't really work either. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it's it's out there somewhere. It's just we're not there yet, and you know, we just got to keep looking. But the thing is, the worst thing we could do is give up. Yep. Keep moving on. Keep moving. Well, that's excellent. Thanks for your time today. Um, really appreciated your insights on the developments that you've seen and uh, where you think we're going to. And uh, your take on the uh, the industry and how it moves forward was also very insightful. Yeah. So that's it for Stallside uh, this episode. We've been talking to Dr. Larry Bramlage with his insights into the development of equine veterinary medicine and, and where we're going as an industry. See you next time. Yeah.